Hi, everybody. We're up. You can see who our guest is, Josh Fox. He's the award-winning director of Gasland, Gasland 2, and How to Let Go of the World and Love All the Things Climate Can't Change. Uh, we gotta, we're going to talk about a lot of things today, his new movie. Uh, we're going to talk about the Draft Bernie Party. We're going to talk about Standing Rock. Let me welcome my guest, Josh Fox. Hi, Josh. Thanks for being with us. Okay, I'm good. I'm in the great city of New Orleans, uh, down here to look at some things uh, related to the Bayou Bridge Pipeline, a, a pipeline that connects to the Dakota Access Pipeline that people are getting geared up to fight right now down here in Louisiana. Now, Josh, why are all these pipeline fights happening? It seems like they're happening all of a sudden. Someone told me it was because yeah. the president of the United States, Barack Obama, used to be against the law to export fossil fuels. And he re did he take away that restriction or did I hear incorrectly? Oh, it's... So much worse than that, Jimmy. So you're right. It has to do with Barack Obama. Um, in the infinite wisdom of the neoliberals, uh, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, and the like, they decided that the best thing for us to do for climate change policy was to phase out all the old coal-fired power plants. Now, that was a good thing. Coal-fired power plants suck. They're an incredible amount of carbon dioxide. They poison communities. Coal is an awful, awful fuel. No one should advocate for coal. However, instead of changing those coal-fired power plants to existing renewable energy technology like solar, like wind, which would be great for the planet and great for communities and great for our economy and for jobs, they decided, um, or rather, they let the natural gas industry infiltrate, the fracked gas industry infiltrate into uh, the White House, and they convinced them to substitute, um, and this is truly unbelievable, fracked gas for coal. So when you build a fracked gas power plant, or you convert a coal-fired power plant to frack gas, you need to do a, a lot of nasty things. Number one, you need to uh, frack everywhere. You probably need millions more fracking wells. And you need to build pipelines. Pipelines, compressor stations, fossil fuel infrastructure. And you have to do that um, for throughout all sorts of people's backyards, throughout all of the United States. In fact, there are 300 new frack gas power plants that are being proposed for uh, this country. That means hundreds of thousands of miles of new pipelines. That means millions of new fracking wells. And the kicker is um, that uh, the natural gas industry told the Obama administration that they were better for the climate than coal, that there were like a step down, like an incrementalist, like the kind of things that um, neoliberals like, like, oh, we're just gonna take a baby step. Well, in fact, that's not even true. Natural gas and fracked gas, which is the same thing, um, leaks into the atmosphere through all of this infrastructure. The pipelines leak, the frack gas wells leak, the compressor stations leak, the power plants themselves leak. They just showed that the power plants are leaking at 120 times uh, more than they thought they were just in a recent study the last three days. So when you're leaking raw methane, which is a greenhouse gas, into the atmosphere, methane is 100 times more potent than carbon dioxide is as a warming agent in the atmosphere. So even if you're leaking just 1% of the methane directly into the atmosphere, you're worse than coal. So not only did they not stop the rising seas and change climate and make everything for better for people, they actually made the situation worse by going from coal to frack gas, worse for the climate, worse for our water. Um, and, of course, now you're seeing all these pipeline battles crop up everywhere because people don't tend to like to have nasty fossil fuel pipelines running through their backyards. And so they keep talking about the uh, natural gas as the bridge to the future. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's kind of a funny yeah. that's kind of a funny bridge if it's you're... worse than coal, right? Well, <laughs> exactly. And everybody knows that if you're already on the other side, then you the only way to go on that bridge is to go backwards, right? They call this the natural gas bridge because there's this idea that we need some bridge to the future, some way to get to the renewable energy technology that is somehow far, far away from us. Well, of course, we know from the Solutions Project and from the work that I've done uh, and Mark Jacobson at Stanford and many other people for years that we don't need a bridge because we're already, we already have the technology. It's like the $6 billion man. We have the technology. We can rebuild our, um, our uh, transform our energy system. We can do this right now. We don't need a bridge. And the kicker about this is that the bridge, um, you know, you think of a bridge as like this short-term thing you, you pass over to get to the other side and then you go along your merry way. A bridge is like a, a tiny connector. Um, but, you know, so it sounds like it's a year or two or five years we're going to go to the gas as a bridge, blah, blah, blah. Well, that bridge happens to be 30 to 40 years long because you don't finance a power plant 
for five years. You have to build a power plant. These things are very expensive to build. So you finance them over 30 to 40 years. So you've just locked yourself in, as the Obama administration, right, um, to a fossil fuel that's worse than coal for the climate for 30 to 40 years. The only person that wants to spend 30 to 40 years on a bridge is Chris Christie. You know, and he's completely out of all political running for, forever and ever because of that. Um, so the bridge scandal, the real bridge scandal, should be the Obama administration and the neoliberals uh, and Hillary Clinton pushing frack gas down our throats because that's a bridge that um, will actually end up putting us underwater, uh, knowing what we know about rising sea levels and climate change. Now, is that just a mistake by the Obama administration and the Democrats that they did, they weren't up on mm. the science and they just got duped by the industry? Or did they know and not really care because they're their donors and they just uh, really don't care? <laughs> Well, Jimmy, you know, at the beginning we thought, well, maybe they're getting this wrong. Maybe they don't have the facts. But this this stuff, I mean, like I started to report on this stuff with frack gas back in 2011. I mean, this was a long time ago, right? This was in, in Obama's first term. There were science uh, scientists that were beating down the door of the White House. I went there myself several times to the Council on Environmental Quality of the White House. Um, there were report after report after peer-reviewed study after you know, I mean, this is very well uh, known that frack gas is worse for for the climate than coal. So one has to imagine, and of course, I'm not in their brains. I don't I don't know them. Um, I don't know what they think. But you have to admit that that there is an incredible influence of the natural gas industry on Washington, and uh, the Democrats are some of the worst in terms of that type of influence, especially when it comes to natural gas and fracking. So. Uh, there's a carbon bubble, I understand, anyway, right? Mm. So you talked about 30, 40 years. So when people invest in a pipeline, you know, that's got to last for a couple decades for it to pay off. And when it looks like it looks like right now that uh, clean energy is coming way and down in price really quickly. And so it's going to yep. make carbon yep. not really economically feasible. So these pipelines, that's why there's yep. a big rush right now to to get them done. Is that is that correct? I, I think that's part of it. I think there's definitely a desperation factor, which is that these new technologies are coming. And, you know, if you can imagine like the rotary phone somehow scrambling to stop the iPhone, you know, <laughs> like you like. You can imagine the executives who built that kind of technology who have no real interest uh, or knowledge or know-how in doing renewables. Because the thing about renewable energy is you can't export it, right? It's here, it's now. You have to use it when you're generating it. It, it's much, it works much better when it's distributed generation, so it's much more democratic. Like if everyone has solar panels on their roof and everyone has that community-generated solar farm, these are things that are much more conducive to democracy. And, you know... Um, uh, I can't really put myself in the mindset of the fossil fuel industry. I've tried many times. Um, I simply can't get that violent um, and insane. Uh, because the, the fossil fuel industry is willing to kill people, is willing to subjugate folks, is willing to pump chemicals into the ground, is willing to pump toxins into the air, it's willing to kill children, it's willing to destroy communities. I, I simply can't put myself in their mindset. But what I do know is that renewable energy technology is here. It's on the march. It's going to be cheaper. It's going to provide way more jobs. It's better for communities. People tend to like the fact, that, I mean, like, you know, uh, a solar spill, it's been said many times, is simply a nice day, you know. Um, so, but so what happens, these, Josh, uh, Josh, what happens? There are impacts from, from, from renewables, but they're nowhere near the impacts of, uh, of fossil fuels. Yeah, like what happens when, it, what happens when the, uh, a windmill crashes and it spills oxygen everywhere? I mean, how do you clean that up? <laughs> I know. Well, look, there are impacts. I mean, there are better places to put wind farms than there are worse places to put wind farms. Like, onshore wind farms do create vibrations. They harm mammals. They harm uh, bats. Um, offshore wind farms, far more uh, conducive to having a, a, a natural coexistence with the ecosystem. Um, you know, you're going to have that no matter what. But I think that when you're talking about climate change, there is no greater impact on species and no greater impacts on birds and bats um, than, than the coming... Um, you know, apocalyptic weather transformations that, that that are in store for us with climate change. We have to really change not just our energy system, we have to change our values. And that was what my last film was about, how to let go of the world, 
and love all the things climate can't change. That world we let go of, that's the world of greed, that's the world of competition, the world of individual, individualism, the world of selfishness, the world of consumerism, the world of violence. Um, you know, when we see the kinds of things that, are, that the police are doing right now, it's clear that they are gearing up for violent unrest. We have to make sure that we maintain our peacefulness. We have to do, like we did at Sandy Rock, 100% peaceful, that we are there um, to, to make a point that violence is one of the things that we're rebelling against. Um, and that this system of control, of authoritarian control, fascist control, um, control over our energy system and our political system and our economic system has to end. And the way that we have to end it is we do that through nonviolent means um, and through, um, th through the, the mobilization and organization of people um, working in a nonviolent way. So, well, that's fantastic. I mean, um, you know, nonviolent protests has changed more things than uh, I can count, but uh, it seems to me... It's our whole history. Yeah. Okay, well, speaking of that, so let me just get to you. Now, you, you, you have a new movie. You want to talk about it? Yeah, I'm really excited. Um, we have just announced that it's going to be at Tribeca Film Festival. Um, it's called Awake, A Dream from Standing Rock. It's a collaboration uh, between myself um, and two other filmmakers um, and some of the, uh, I guess, um, indigenous leaders at Standing Rock. Um, so it's myself, uh, it's uh, three directors, my, uh, James Spione, who's a fellow Oscar nominee, a documentarian, and Myra Dewey, um, who uh, I think a lot of people know from Digital Smoke Signals, the incredible drone pilots and live streaming outfit that was there at Standing Rock for over four months. So um, I'm the producer of the project, um, and I, I got these filmmakers together, um, as well as Florice White Bull and Doug Goodfeather, um, who are from Standing Rock, who have advised the project, and Florice has co-written it, uh, co-written my section with me. Um, so it's truly a, a collaboration project. There are three sections. I direct the first James B. on the second, Myron Dewey the third, and then there's a co coda that we collaborated on. Um, so we, do, we did that in order to get the project done quickly, so that right at the beginning of the Trump administration, we had an uh, incredibly compelling um, rallying cry, a film that brought you what really, um, a, a number of the stories that are on the ground at, at Standing Rock. Um, there's no way that one filmmaker or even 10 filmmakers could tell the whole story of Standing Rock. Standing Rock is an incredible, complex universe of so many things that happened. But we are bringing you a, a, a triumvirate and many other perspectives within that film of what happened there. It is incredibly moving. It is designed like a dream. It's called Awake, a Dream from Standing Rock. We're asking people to join our dream. Um, and the amazing thing that we're doing is we're releasing it at Tribeca Film Festival on April 22nd, Earth Day, um, perfect day to put that out and we're going to have a big celebration in New York City with Doug Goodfeather, with Myron Dewey with, um, uh, with uh, other people uh, Florice Whitebull I know Francis Fisher is going to be there um, Shailene Woodley who is the person who got me involved with Standing Rock is one of the executive producers on the film um, and so we're going to have this big celebration in New York but simultaneously to their premiere we're going to be releasing the film on our own platform awakethefilm.org and people can uh, buy a three-day rental for uh, pay what you can. So anywhere between a dollar and a hundred dollars, and a hundred percent of the proceeds go towards an indigenous media fund that we are creating to create uh, more indigenous filmmaking. Um, that's uh, uh, overseen by uh, Digital Smoke Signals and other folks from the indigenous community, um, and a Pipeline Fighters Fund. So that we're going to be um, working with how do we uh, increase a lot of these other pipeline fights that are happening through media through reporting and through um, doing rallies at those places. So 100% of the proceeds um, go from awakethefilm.org. When you download that film or for, for a three-day rental, 100% um, of those proceeds go towards the fight um, and go towards indigenous uh, sovereignty media and um, towards the pipeline fighters. And there's many, many pipeline battles that are cropping up all across this country. We're really excited. This is a disruptive uh, way of distributing a movie. Um, and we are trying to sort of disrupt the way that, um, you know, the traditional way that films get out there into the world and do this in a new way so that it directly benefits the movement and that it's like we kind of eliminate the middleman. So, you know, we get that film out to you and it's pay what you can. So anywhere from a dollar to a hundred dollars, that's a donation. You can write that off. Um, and that donation then uh, allows you access to the film and it, and it contributes to our fight um, 
uh, for uh, you know clean water and for indigenous sovereignty and for and for that in the media as well. So now that so the money that goes to the indigenous media project. Now I I watched uh, CNN's reports about Standing Rock and I think I know everything that was going on there. <laughs> what the, what else well, could they I mean... possibly tell me? <laughs> I mean, both sides do it. It seemed, it seemed like I, the water protectors were in the wrong, and it seemed like the cops were in the wrong. It seemed like there was a lot of blame to go around, Josh. Yeah, well, see, this is the problem. <laughs> like, so much of the media is in the tank. <laughs> and, I mean, you know this very well. Mm-hmm. Obviously, Young Turks is a great example of a, of a new institution that, that, well, not so new, but, but of a popular institution, I should say, that is flying in the face of a lot of what these major media outlets will tell us. Um, Look, every time I go on MSNBC, every time I go on CNN, my appearance is bookended by um, fossil fuel commercials, right? And then often what will happen is they'll put out like the both sides, right? Both sides of the story. Let's make sure we tell both sides. Can you imagine if this was not about fossil fuels, but if this was about race relations? Like, can you imagine if we say, well, let's cut to the KKK and get their opinion? You know, can you imagine if that was the case with, um, you know, on CNN? But that's what CNN is doing. Um, the, the, the police force, um, I, I don't even want to call them a police force, the militarized um, force that was there to um, arrest people and brutalize people at Standing Rock, um, this is very much on display in our film, Awake, A Dream from Standing Rock, and it really goes into the brutality that happened there. It's an incredible, and then it goes into even more detail on the other side, the peace uh, and the prayer um, and the, the, the community and the value structure of the water protectors. The water protectors are the heroes of this film, and they are incredible. Um, but yeah, you know, look, we need more media from the non-corporate perspective. Um, that's what I consider myself. It's, uh, I'm an independent documentarian. That's what I consider James. We need more, more media from the indigenous perspective. There is no question that the values that we need now are those indigenous values. Um, so, you know, we're as a collective of filmmakers to making this movie awake, um, that is our collaboration in a way that Standing Rock was a collaboration in itself too, so, right? Because Standing Rock, the, the, the nation called upon people from all races and all walks of life to please come there. And so that is reflected, I think, in the spirit of this project. And, um, you know, like what we're trying to make sure to do is we challenge that corporate media structure and do it through action. Um, we do it through, um, you know, really putting the, the, the funding for the film through these action funds. And one of the ways that we act is by telling that story and making sure that you have an alternative narrative to the corporate media because, um, you know, and of course, then action, you know, like we just, just straight up action. Like we've created rallies. We created a rally in New York City um, the day uh, I, uh, that Trump announced that he was going to push the pipeline forward. We created uh, what were called climate revolution rallies. We did those at the DNC. We did them in um, in Los Angeles. And those climate revolution rallies were a direct way of uh, organizing and impacting the situation. We've done civil disobedience actions uh, in front of FERC. Um, I made a short film called The Last Drop, where we were protesting the Constitution pipeline. Um, and a, a number of us got arrested in front of FERC. So we're 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 not just a film company. We're also a direct action um, organization. So you know we're trying to make sure that that stays within uh, the realm of what we're doing. Um, that this isn't just about okay, here's a nice story for you to watch this on your TV or whatever. No, this is about action. Yeah, I like and I, I I appreciate that you do direct action and I, that you put your body in in harm's way. And I I also appreciate that you have success doing it. Right. So it's not all. Uh, this is actually a story about success. Also, so that's good things. Like you have to fight, but uh, oftentimes when you fight, mm-hmm. you can win. Now you you were up. You you protested at Dapple under President Barack Obama and under Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. Uh, was there yeah. any diff- Was there any difference? Well, I mean, I think that um, we actually won that fight with Obama. Um, there's a big difference, you know. So Barack Obama on December 4th, sent the pipeline back for an, uh, for an environmental review. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, um, you know, said we're going to have to do an environmental impact study, and that should have been in place now. Um, but in fact, the truth is that our government decided, because of all the protest action, that the project was not uh, possible to just simply okay. It had to be studied, and that that study was going to take anywhere between six months. And that's what the water protectors did under the Obama administration. They got, they broke through to him, and he sent the project back for a review. Now, let's be really 100% clear about this. 
Donald Trump has not just pushed the Dakota Access Pipeline forward. Donald Trump has overturned the rule of law. And, you know, we can say a lot about policy. Policy under the Republicans is atrocious. Policy under neoliberals a lot of the time is atrocious. I think there is something different when you have a, a president who's willing to completely upend the rule of law and say, like, like, look at how many lawsuits Donald Trump has against him, like thousands, right? So he's pushing our entire system to say, take me down if you can, sue me, or whatever you have, whatever you can do, you know? And some of those lawsuits, obviously, with the Muslim ban, right, obviously were, were overturned. So the Muslim ban was overturned because our court system said, no, you cannot do that. It would be, uh, it did not happen in the same way with the Dakota Access Pipeline. He overturned the rule of law. There are lawsuits pending, and there are still lawsuits pending. Um, but um, we need that same type of popular outcry right now to stop this march of fossil fuels and stop the march of fossil fuel industry. Uh, what we saw in North Dakota were militarized vehicles, tanks, um, people being arrested who were sitting there praying at, at point of a, of a M4 rifles. It looked, looked like Fallujah. I mean, this was not... A pretty scene. Every time I see it, I break down in tears. I cannot. It's 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 a it's an incredible tragedy. Yeah, um, it's so yeah. I do think that there's a difference, obviously, in just in terms of the result. What do you say to the idea that you know because a lot of this these pipes lines and this fracking, I mean, it was being pushed really hard by the neoliberals, was it not? I mean, didn't oh most... sure. So I, I I wouldn't disagree with that. I think that it took us way too much of our own energy to fight Dakota Access Pipeline. Way too much of our own energy to fight the Keystone XL Pipeline. We should have had Barack Obama roll into office in 2009 and say, fracking? Eh, get rid of that. We're done. Absolutely. If Barack Obama... I mean, look, <laughs> I remember being... I was on the platform committee for the Democrats, right? right. Myself and Bill McKibben, um, Dr. Cornell West, Deborah Parker, Ben Jealous, Nina Turner. I served alongside of those amazing folks. And Nomaki Konst, right? From, who's on TYT now. Right. Um, and we, uh, I remember sitting down with Bill and Bill saying, you know, Barack Obama had one line in his inaugural address that said, we're going to stop the rising seas about climate change. One line that he spoke. We used that one line to hold him accountable on Keystone XL. And we went out there and we, we berated him with that one line, that one thing that he said. And it worked. And he sent Keystone XL back to the drawing board. Donald Trump doesn't care what he said last week. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So the truth of the matter is, <laughs> I mean, Obama should have just done those things. If Obama really wanted to stop the rising seas, the science is really clear. So absolutely, we lost eight years. In fact, during Obama, emissions of greenhouse gases probably went up, not down. Obama boasted in the 2012 debates that he drilled more on public lands than George Bush, and George Bush was an oil man. I mean, you can look it up. Obama was atrocious on fossil fuels. Obama was fracker in chief. No question. And in many ways, if you think about what's happening with the State Department, you've got Rex Tillerson, who is the Secretary of State. He's the guy who ran ExxonMobil. He's the Secretary of State. Now, however, Hillary Clinton, when she was the Secretary of State, went around the country arm in arm with ExxonMobil promoting fracking in 30 countries worldwide. So which is, when you have to think about this, which is stronger? Rex Tillerson on his own, being a vulnerable, obvious head of a fossil fuel industry, or Hillary Clinton, the sort of liberal, cool, liber Hillary Clinton, introducing ExxonMobil? Would, would, you, would, would you rather have your dem d diplomat be? So you say, like, this is leads us around to our other question. What are we going to do? I mean, obviously, what I think um, we have to do is I have to put out films and we have to have cultural rallying cries and we have to have those rallies and we have to have those screenings and all that kind of thing. It's very, very important. We want people to watch those movies. But psh, movies don't change the world. Action changes the world. We have to take action. And I was on the platform committee because Bernie Sanders said, go and do this thing with the platform committee. What is Bernie saying now? Well, Bernie is fighting every step of the way. I think Bernie is the leader the most powerful and most important American voice in politics worldwide right now. There's no question of that. But how are we going to do that within the Democratic Party? I don't see it. I think we have to have something new. And I don't know what that is, whether that's a movement of independence where we push forward uh, or whether that's a new party altogether. I think it's clear that we need Bernie or else we won't, we won't make it. I think we need Bernie to lead that. But I think there's an incredible class of new leadership that's coming up, and I'm talking about Nina Turner, Ben Jealous, Zephyr Teachout, um, people like Jane Klebb, 
uh, people who are on that board of our revolution who are phenomenal and amazing. Um, you know, there are people out there that could be uh, those 500 Luke Skywalkers to Bernie Sanders, Obi Wan Kenobi. We need that to go. Out. We need that right now. You know what I mean? So yeah. we, we we have to discuss um, what we're going to do next because certainly um, with the with, with Keith Keith Ellison lost the Democratic National Convention and that national chairmanship. Um, it became very clear that the Democrats do not want to learn from the past. They do, do not want to change. They want to remain the party of lobbyists and bankers and fossil fuel industry. So we've got to figure out what we're doing next. Yeah, so t- as far as I'm concerned, like the Democrats are planning on how to how to get, lose even more seats and be more wiped out. And the only thing they really have going for them is that Trump, right? They're, they're, that their opponents are just as inept in, in very many ways as they are. In fact, they have no ideas that make people's lives better or only make people's lives worse. And yet the Democrats are wiped out by this party, this party of zero ideas except bad ideas. Hey everybody, the next live Jimmy Dore show is April 3rd in Hollywood. There's only 50 tickets for that show, so get them quick. Our show after that is April 24th. That's in Burbank. Links for tickets right there. Get your tickets fast. Sell out quick.